Cambodian painter Van Nath creates vibrant scenes of his country's rich history and peaceful moments in its lush countryside. But the work he is better known for is darker. It portrays the time he spent under torture and interrogation as a prisoner of the Khmer Rouge. I was arrested December 30th, 1977, and taken away from my village by truck. Van Nath was targeted for being an artist, a member of the elite educated class, and therefore, according to the Khmer Rouge, an enemy of the people. I arrived at the prison at 3 a.m. They measured how tall I am, and they took pictures of me. I was accused of betraying the party line, and they interrogated me. All around me I could hear people being beaten, screaming and yelling because of their pain. I did not know then what happened to these people, but then finally I found out that they were taken away. Taken away to the infamous killing fields by the hundreds of thousands. From 1975 to 1979, the Khmer Rouge presided over one of the most brutal periods in history. Marked by mass executions, death by starvation and forced labor, all in an attempt to create a demented vision of a communist utopia, dreamed up and carried out by Pol Pot and his cadres. Everywhere you go, uh, you see mass grave, you see skull. Whenever you have any conversation with any one of your neighbor, Khmer Rouge stories coming up all the time. Just like a broken glass, when you drop a glass on the floor and broken, it's, it's, it's what we are. Yuk Chang runs the Documentation Center of Cambodia, which is dedicated to collecting proof of the atrocities that engulfed his nation. At the age of 14, he himself was tortured. His father and sister were killed. He is now custodian of the thousands of photographs, documents, and interviews that provide the body of evidence that might one day convict those responsible for the deaths of an estimated two million people, around a quarter of the entire population. Now, three decades later, that day may finally be here. In the dusty outskirts of the capital, Phnom Penh, a shiny new courthouse has been built. It is called the Extraordinary Chambers in the Courts of Cambodia, a lofty name with lofty ambitions to finally bring justice to a country that has yet to see any accounting for crimes they have suffered. By the hundreds, Cambodians from across the country are being bussed in to tour the complex, to see where trials will be held, to understand that the tribunal is really here. It is finally happening. Lee Pran lost his father, brother, and sister to the Khmer Rouge. It is important for me and the Cambodian people because I can see justice inside. As victims and survivors of the regime, we can find some justice through this tribunal. The tour was sponsored by Yuk Chang's organization. It's the idea to warm them up, to prepare them for the trial, so that in such a way they get less intimidated, to reduce their fear. Having them see it and hear it, they create their own messages and they can tell their neighbor, I was there, there's a trial. It is understandable that there might be a good deal of disbelief that a tribunal 30 years in the making has finally arrived. It wasn't until 1997 that the Cambodian government was stable enough or even willing to consider holding a trial. Six years of bitter negotiations with the United Nations followed over just how international the court should be. The result is a complicated jointly run process that keeps a great portion of the control in the hands of the domestic legal system a system many observers consider squarely in the hands of the government. I think there is a great deal of skepticism among many Cambodians who learn about the court and who know about the court and watch the court. Um, I think that comes from a basic distrust on the part of many Cambodians of the independence of the judicial system. The weakness of the Cambodian judiciary is a charge the court itself doesn't deny. Not a little weak, very weak. And uh, I think it was in actual acknowledgement of that fact that the government asked for, for international assistance. Helen Jarvis is the chief spokesperson for the court. She says an elaborate method has been developed to ensure this hybrid tribunal, made up of 17 Cambodian but only 13 international judges, remains independent. There's a complex formula of voting, which means that any decision has to involve both 
international and national. It's called a supermajority. It is a very complicated system, which is one of the things that I think is a concern for those people who are following the court and, and frankly for those people who are involved in the court, of how the Cambodians and the international players are going to work well together. And if they're not able to negotiate positive relationships, there will be a myriad of sort of procedural difficulties and delays that will be extremely unfortunate. The court cannot afford those delays. It has a short three-year mandate in which it is already likely there will be time for no more than a small, some would say symbolic, handful of prosecutions. It's expected that it will be few in number. Neither the UN side nor the Cambodian side uh, envisaged a trawling through the, the country finding everybody who had uh, committed crimes during that period. The concern is more to establish a judicial accounting of those at the top. Although it may be some time before any indictments are announced, there are around six likely defendants well known to the Cambodian public. They are the surviving so-called senior leaders of the Khmer Rouge, and most of them are still living with utter impunity within Cambodia because of amnesty deals originally made by the government in the 1990s. Nguyen Che, known as Brother No. 2 and second-in-command only to Brother No. 1, Pol Pot, lives modestly but comfortably in a small town near the Thai border. Yang Sari, the former foreign minister of the regime, now lives in a large villa in a wealthy neighborhood of Phnom Penh. He is well known about town. He hang out on the street, you know, drinking uh, fruit shakes on the streets. Uh, he bought land, you know, he had his son make deputy governor. And he have all of this, you know, to secure his life. That after all this happened, you know, you won't have a good life. You know, he destroy our family but preserve his own. The amnesty issue is going to be a difficult one because there were several individuals that were granted amnesties and pardons in connection with trials that were conducted um, in the past that were not conducted in accordance with international standards, but nonetheless were conducted for genocide during that period. The court and the judges of the court will have to decide what, if any, impact those amnesties have. So far, only two Khmer Rouge leaders have ever been arrested. Comrade Doik, who ran the torture prison where painter Van Nath was kept, was discovered in 1999, living under a new identity as an aid worker in a refugee camp. The only other senior leader taken into custody was military commander Tom Mock, known as the Butcher. But the 80-year-old died just weeks after the court was sworn in, denying it what many expected would be its first case. Indeed, it is this race against time that survivors like Van Nath worry may be the biggest challenge to the success of the court. He himself is suffering from kidney disease and fears that justice so delayed may not end up being justice at all. I have a little hope that we will get a good result from the court, but we have no other choice. We have waited, and so we will keep waiting. But I don't know if I will live long enough to see the justice. We have it. a saying in Khmer that uh, dying without closing your eyes, meaning that you, you don't die peacefully, you die that your wish had not been fulfilled. And many victims have feel in such a way. We know that, that every day uh, there's a possibility that possible defendants die, that people who have been waiting for justice for a long time also die before they get to see this happen, even if they're not directly involved in the trial themselves. We know that physical sites have been lost and will continue to be lost, but at least there has been time for documentation. There's another advantage, and that is we're not in an immediate post-conflict situation here. In Cambodia, a whole generation has passed. People are impatient, and they want the accounting. Despite these deep concerns and significant challenges, Cambodians themselves do seem to largely support the trials, perhaps knowing that as time passes, there are increasingly few other options left for justice. This is Twel Slang once a middle school that was turned into the very torture center that Van Nath somehow survived, one of only seven of the more than 14,000 Cambodians imprisoned here. The prison is now a museum dedicated to the building's bloody history. Here, as in so many other places you go in this country, 
it is easy to find someone who suffered at the hands of the Khmer Rouge and who sees the trial as some sort of closure. When I come here, I am reminded of what Pol Pot did to me and the whole country. I want to see this tribunal happen quite soon, because I want to see the people who committed these crimes face the law. In these halls, Van Nath's paintings now hang as a witness to the technical realities of torture, meant to remind and educate a younger generation, those too young to have been alive when the Khmer Rouge held the country in its grips. These are real pictures. I want the younger generation to know that this is not made up. This is the real thing. With almost 70 percent of the Cambodian population under the age of 30, it is perhaps this final chance at historical record and national dialogue, even if imperfect, that supporters of the courts say may be its greatest legacy. Any form of tribunal would not bring back what we have lost. Any kind. You can have the purest international tribunal, have the most intelligent lawyers in the world. It won't bring back two million lives. It won't be able to restore what has been broken. But the process to understand, to see, to hear, and to discuss this openly, I think that's, that to me that's the most important. Van Nath agrees and says that any pain he may have to relive will be worth the chance of justice. For me, the trauma is not hearing again of the crimes. For me, the trauma would be if there were no trials at all. And if they ask me to testify, I will contribute before I die for the soul of those who were killed by the Khmer Rouge. Thank you.